Good evening. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Gotti Schwartz coming to you from Los Angeles. And here are the stories we're watching tonight. Expelled Tennessee lawmaker Justin Pearson is back in office. Now that the Shelby County Commission can done their job. Yeah. I'm so glad we get to get back to doing our job. Yeah. Then 911 calls from Monday's deadly mass shooting have been released, including a call from the shooter's mother. I, I don't know what to do. I need your help. <laughs> I think he, he's never hurt me once. He's a really good kid. Please don't come up to me. And a fire at a plastics facility in Indiana has forced people within a half a mile to evacuate. And it looks like a potentially sensitive document about President Biden's overseas trip was just found lying in a street in Belfast. Plus, some good news for omelet lovers. The price of eggs is going down, but does that mean inflation is finally cracking? The two Tennessee Democrats who were expelled from the House of Representatives last week have both been reinstated to their positions. Re Representative Justin Jones was voted back in by the Nashville Council on Monday, and today in Memphis, the second Democrat, Representative Justin Pearson, was voted back in as well. Now, Pearson spoke to his supporters after the reinstatement, using the moment yet again to talk about gun reform, which is the issue he was protesting with a megaphone before he and Jones were expelled. six kids, the six people in Nashville, yeah. the three children who are just nine years old, yeah. celebrate the five folk in Louisville yeah. who died from gun violence that was preventable. Yeah. They tried to kill democracy. Yeah. They tried to expel the people's choice and the people's vote. Yeah. And they awakened a sleeping yeah. child. NBC News correspondent Blaine Alexander joins us now. So, Blaine, is this business as usual for these lawmakers now, or do they go back to work today, tomorrow, uh, next week? Well, it could be within just a few hours, Gotti. Uh, Pearson's team tells me that tomorrow at 8 a.m. sharp local time, he is going to be sworn in. He's leaving here in Memphis. He's going about three and a half hours away to Nashville, and that's where he's going to be sworn in tomorrow morning. So as of about 8.30 a.m., both he and Representative Jones will be right back in their old seats. Now, as for all of the things that come with being representatives, you know, earlier this week, we saw a very strongly worded letter from lawyers on behalf of the two uh, ousted and now reinstated lawmakers essentially saying this. They wanted to make sure that all of their privileges were back just as they should be, as they said. So that means their parking, that means their email addresses, their badges, even their previous committee assignments. They want to make sure it's like they never left. And that's something that certainly both lawmakers say they're going to be watching for. Now, I should say that the leader of uh, the Speaker of the House, the Republican, says that he's going to seat whoever the counties send back without any sort of hiccups or interruptions, Gotti. Uh, just a recap here. They were voted in during the regular election, then they were voted out. Now they were voted in, but they still have one more vote to get permanently back, right? When could we see a special election here? A lot of steps. You're absolutely right. So right now they're there, but just on an interim basis. The governor has to set a date for a special election. That could come sometime later this summer, probably in the early months of the summer. Uh, but already Tennessee Democrats are raising money for them to win those elections. It's very likely that they will go back and win those elections. And they both said that they intend to run for that special election. Gotti. Speaking of the governor, Blaine, uh, Tennessee's governor signed an executive order today strengthening background checks. Uh, do you think that this may have played a role? Well, the governor certainly pointed to the tragedy that happened at the school in Nashville that killed six people, three of them young children. Uh, basically, he was pretty strong in his words, saying that nothing is too far to guarantee the safety of the children here in the state of Tennessee. So that executive order that he signed, it did a couple of things. One, it, it strengthened um, the background checks. So it means that uh, crimes have to be reported to the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation within a 72 hour period. But he's also really trying to put uh, some pressure on his his members of his own party, fellow Republican lawmakers here in the state, calling on them to pass red flag laws. That's certainly notable, of course, when you look at the party from which the governor uh, is sitting and making these calls. Now, of course, still TBD whether or not they're actually going to take that up this session, but it's certainly something that he's calling for. Blaine Alexander, thank you.
Meanwhile, we are following the latest out of Louisville after a mass shooting killed five people and hurt eight others at the Old National Bank on Monday. Today, audio of several 911 calls has been released, and one of those calls came from the alleged shooter's mother. Here's part of it, but we want to warn you that some of what you're about to hear may be disturbing. Mother, I'm so sorry. I'm getting details so I can hear them on your show now. Oh, my Lord. I, I don't know what to do. I need your help. I, I think he, he's never hurt me once. He's a really good kid. Please don't come up him. He's non-violent. Mm -hmm. He's never done anything. Please. Okay. And you don't believe he owns guns? I know he doesn't own any guns. Let's bring in NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky from Louisville, where a community just gathered to pray at a vigil. Morgan, hearing that 911 call for the community and then knowing what happened after and what happened uh, to all of those victims, uh, what's, what's the latest? Yeah, got a tough day for a lot of folks here in Louisville. This uh, Muhammad Ali Civic Center just cleared out after being filled with several hundred, if not more people for this vigil that lasted the better part of an hour. Every day we've had this week since the shooting Monday morning, there's been a, a bit more insight, uh, some new evidence that uh, paints a very grim and disturbing picture. I think it started yesterday with the body cam release of those two officers, and that continued today with uh, these 911 calls being released where you hear from more multiple people inside hiding from the shooter. Uh, you also hear from people outside knowing that those uh, loved ones are being fired upon. Uh, and you combine that with the loss of five lives in this community, and a lot of people, I think, are still processing this. I know that we've had a chance to hear from some of the family members of those whose lives were lost on Monday. Uh, and I wanted you to hear what one of them had to say in their own words on having to say goodbye to someone in such a tragic way. Take a listen. I know there's different signs of grief, but my grief is that I can't hear her voice anymore. I can't touch her. I can't tell her how much I love her and how I'm just thankful she's in my life. And here at the vigil, we saw person after person, uh, both leaders and members of the community, essentially sharing a split message here, Gotti. On one hand, they offered so much support and compassion and love to the families of those uh, who are dealing with the loss, such as that woman. Uh, another was change, calling for change. Louisville now recognizes that they've joined an infamous list of cities that have been afflicted by this uniquely American epidemic of gun violence. And we're hearing yet again a community say enough is enough. As to whether or not anything will change, uh, time will only tell. Gotti? Morgan, heartbreaking to hear uh, that mother. What else do we know about some of the other victims, uh, both, both those that died and, and those who are still recovering at the hospital? Well, if there's been any silver lining to any of this, it's that day by day, the hospital has provided updates on more uh, patients being discharged. At last check, uh, three of the nine who were wounded in this shooting uh, remain in the hospital. Two of those in fair condition, um, not life-threatening injuries. One patient remains in critical condition. That's 26-year-old uh, Nicholas Wilt. He, of course, one of those first two officers who responded, whose body cam video we watched yesterday. And I, I heard something very powerful at this vigil today. Uh, one man had a chance to speak to the mother of Officer Wilt. And she shared that when she watched that video of her 26-year-old son rushing towards the gunman, putting himself in harm's way so as to take the gunman's attention away from those in danger, she said she looked at his hands, the hands of a police officer who was just having his fourth shift on the job under heavy gunfire. And she says not once did they shake or waver. Gotti? Huh. Incredible. Morgan Chesky, thanks so much. In Indiana, authorities are still working to contain a huge fire that broke out at a plastics recycling center yesterday. You can see it there, that massive black plume just looming over the entire town. Uh, people have been posting these videos from their homes, just the thick cloud of black smoke there. Today, uh, the county health department said, if you can see the smoke from your home, you should immediately evacuate.
These are very fine particles, and if they're breathed in, can cause all kinds of respiratory problems, burning of the eyes, uh, tightening of the chest. It could uh, aggravate asthma. We are stressing to the public to honor the evacuation zone. If you can um, see the smoke, you're in the smoke, get out of the smoke. And right now, the mandatory evacuation orders are in place within a half a mile of that disaster. EPA personnel are on the ground testing air quality, all while officials are saying that that fire can smolder for days. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa joins us now from Richmond, Indiana. Maggie, uh, I, I got to ask, you've got that mask on there. I know you're a little ways away, but uh, it looks like that trailer behind you, right behind that is where that fire was burning. What does the air smell like where you are? So, Gotti, the thing that we should point out is that we're wearing the mask out of an abundance of caution. We're far enough away, and this is really important, we are upwind from the fire. So, frankly, at this point, in this location, I can't smell anything. But when we've been driving around the town, um, we have been able to kind of get a whiff of just really what kind of so smells like burning, smells like... It's not a fire smell that you're, you're used to smelling. It's not a wildfire smell, which we've covered before. You and I both have. It really does have a little bit of a toxic smell to it. So as soon as we smelled that, we got out of there. But yeah, we just want to be very clear. We're wearing this mask out of that abundance of caution. We're safety-minded, if nothing else, but we are a safe distance away. Uh, and the wind plays such an important factor. I'm glad you pointed that out. Do we know how this fire broke out? You got it. At this point, officials say we don't. There was obviously a back and forth between the city and the current owner of this site saying basically that the city has accused the owner of sort of ignoring warning signs and there have been unsafe practices on that property. But as far as what finally combusted, as far as how this fire finally started yesterday afternoon around 2.30, officials say they've been on the site, they've been going through it. At this point, they're starting to transition into putting out hot spots, but that could take days given what's there and given what's burning and the size of this place. They said they just haven't been able to nail down a cause. They've been too overwhelmed, keeping this fire back, especially from those neighborhoods that are nearby. Got it. And Maggie, just looking at some of those drone shots, you see how many homes there are close to uh, where that fire was burning. And then you think they said about a half a mile radius of that fire, people should evacuate. Are people evacuating? We met people who are, and we met people who aren't. Basically, they said initially they expected 2,000 people to evacuate, then they kind of lowered that to at least 1,500. So you got to think that maybe they're going through those realizations too. We've had conversations with people today about why they left and why they stayed. Take a listen. I've never been that scared. I was in tears. I was calling my kids to come help me. I was like, guys, come on. Somebody, one of you girls, come help me. I've never been in that type of scare before. I've been here since I was five years old. I'm not leaving the house. Uh, you know, my dad, my dad died in that house. I will probably will too. That's my house. I want to note the first woman that you heard from, she and I talked for probably about half an hour, and she was so frantic when she was evacuating Gotti that she was trying to carry, like, family photos, and then she tried to pick up her cat, and she actually injured her back. So she was sitting in her car because her back was kind of seizing up. She was so panicked when she was trying to get out ahead of this fire. So heartbreaking talk with her. Yeah, and, and looking forward towards the next week, what's the biggest concern right now, and, and what does containment look like? I know this thing can burn for days. Burn for days, possibly into Saturday is kind of the potential estimate that we're hearing, or at least don't expect it to be out before then. Kind of these next steps are bringing in the EPA, who are on, on the ground right now. President Biden reiterating to Indiana's governor today that federal resources are at the state's disposal. And those federal resources largely in the form of EPA officials who they say are testing the air quality and they're testing the water quality as well. They say 24-7, particularly for cancer-causing or potentially cancer-causing contaminants that are often found in plastic, especially when plastic burns. They said today they have not found those in the air. That's really important. But they have found particulates, the kind of things you expect in a fire, which is still toxic and can still burn your eyes and your throat. So definitely something to be watching out for, but still a lot of questions. Got it. Can't tell you how comforting it is to see your mask on after hearing all of that. Maggie Vespa, thanks so very much. 
And a very tense morning in Japan as some people in Hokkaido woke up to the sounds of air raid sirens and warnings about a North Korean missile flying overhead. Now, authorities say North Korea appears to have launched an intercontinental ballistic missile that flew either close to or directly over Japan, prompting the high alerts and a warning for a potential evacuation. And now there's a lot of confusion over where exactly that missile went down. NBC's Aaron Gilchrist is monitoring the very latest. Aaron, what do we know right now? Gotti, we're still trying to gather information on this. Not, not a whole lot known at this point, but we do know that the this what happened, the missile launch that we believe happened according to South Korea and Japan was serious enough that Japan sent out an alert. There were videos posted to social media of sirens going off in uh, Hokkaido in the, the northern island there in Japan near uh, the Korean peninsula. And then the alert that went out, and it was a serious alert that said evacuate immediately Please evacuate to a building or underground space immediately. There was a belief that this missile had been launched from North Korea and that uh, it was going to fall in Hokkaido within minutes of this, this alert going out. And then again, a second alert went out just a few seconds, really, after the first that said, essentially, uh, we've been able to look at this more closely, do more analysis. This is according to uh, the reports that came out from Japan, from the Japanese government, and confirmed that there's no longer any possibility of a missile falling onto Hokkaido or in the vicinity of that city. And so the the alert was rescinded, Gotti. But scary moments early in the morning, uh, Thursday morning there in Japan. What a terrifying morning. And Aaron, any word from North Korea? Was this a test? Was this a message? Could it have been both? So it, it could have been both, actually, yeah. But there's not been any official word from North Korea at this point. The North Korean news agency had reported earlier this week that the uh, North Korean leader was tasking his military with making sure that it was better prepared for uh, an offensive if, in fact, if there was a, a need for that uh, after seeing uh, some, uh, some of the military exercises that the U.S. and South Korea had been engaging in uh, in recent days and weeks. And so uh, there's, there's definitely... An order, it seems, coming from the North Korean leader to be ready for something and possibly the missile launch that uh, the South Koreans and the Japanese are reporting today was uh, a step in that direction. Aaron, thanks so much for the update. And still ahead on this hour, a report from Dublin where America's Irish president is tracing his roots all around the 25th anniversary of the deal that ended years of violence. We don't have to go through that and I feel really grateful for that, like that we don't have to grow up in that type of environment. And it's time to check headlines around the world in 80 seconds. Mexico's top immigration official, Francisco Garduño, will face criminal charges in a fire that killed 40 migrants at that government-run detention center. That fire happened last month in Ciudad Juarez, and federal prosecutors are alleged that Garduño was negligent in protecting them. Also in Mexico, archaeologists recently discovered what they think is a, a stone scoreboard used in an ancient soccer-like game. It displays Mayan hieroglyphic writing, and it's thought to be, get this, more than a thousand years old. And will he or won't he? That's been the question on the minds of a lot of royal watchers. Tonight, we've finally got an answer. Prince Harry will attend the coronation of his father, King Charles III, next month. But his wife, Meghan, Duchess of Sussex, is going to stay in California with their two kids. And how's this for around the world? Tomorrow, the European Space Agency is going to launch its historic Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer in French Guiana. It will explore the three largest icy moons of Jupiter. And if it all goes according to plan, it'll arrive in Jupiter's orbit in July of 2031. And that is pretty juicy, which is also the name of the mission. Now on to Northern Ireland, where today President Biden made a speech in Belfast for the anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. This place is transformed by peace, made technicolor by peace, made whole by peace. And signed in 1998, the political deal brought an end to the decades of fighting known as the Troubles. The agreement was approved by public votes in both Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. That was back then, but how do people feel today? Paul Smith from our partners at Getty spoke to a younger generation of Catholics and Protestants about what the Good Friday Agreement means to them. Through the Good Friday Agreement, people weren't really afraid to go to Ireland anymore because there wasn't as much violence anymore. 
What, Abby, what does the Good Friday Agreement mean to you? Having, like, the freedom to be able to go into town, having, like, new companies, being able to start up. Can I just ask you, do your parents talk to you about what they lived through yeah. and yeah. how, do they say how fortunate you are? Yeah, yeah. yeah. all the time. <laughs> like, the change that there's been, do you know, you hear stories of, like, soldiers and fields and stuff and it's just you could never imagine it yourself because I'm from the countryside like I could never imagine and even like the checkpoints and all we don't have to go through that and I feel really grateful for that like that we don't have to grow up in that type of environment and President Biden promised to uphold that landmark peace deal in his remarks today, but his trip also comes at a time of tension between the United States and the UK. Before his big speech in Belfast, Biden met with British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander is in Dublin. Peter, how did the meeting with Mr. Sunak go? Because at one point, the Biden administration seemed to be defending itself today for being anti-British. What's, what's going on there? Yeah, Gaiden, uh, Gotti, given the long-standing sectarian violence, the tensions that still to this day exist in Northern Ireland, I think there was a lot of concern that having an American president who so publicly identifies with his Irish roots may inflame those tensions. But President Biden did notably make his first stop here in Northern Ireland. And in his public remarks, he really went out of his way to emphasize both his English and Irish Roots. The president also said that the Good Friday Agreement that brought peace now for 25 years to that region was good for both sides. Gotti. And Peter, there's this report from the USA Today on, on some of the sensitive security information yep. detailing the president's trip that was found on a street in Belfast. What's the Secret Service saying about that? Yeah, the Secret Service, Gotti, is speaking out tonight, acknowledging this report that um, there was a local resident who picked up a lost document with, as they describe it, potentially sensitive information that had been dropped by a local police officer from the Northern Irish Police. But the Secret Service says that it will not in any way impact their ability to protect President Biden while he's overseas, Gotti. All that happening while well, the threat level there is still pretty high. How did the Irish and specifically how did the Northern Irish people react to, to the president's speech today? I think the White House feels pretty good about the reception it received, both here in Ireland, certainly, where the president is retracing his roots, but earlier in Northern Ireland as well, the president glad-handing with many of the politicians on both sides there after his remarks earlier today, and really speaking about the future, about how the Good Friday Agreement, again signed in 1998, that brought peace to a region that had been marred by sectarian violence, what was known as the Troubles for 25 years, the president focusing on how the young people of that region deserve a future that everybody can be proud of. Gotti. Peter Alexander, thanks so much. And still to come, a massive legal slap in the defamation lawsuit against Fox News and accusations of withholding evidence. But first, you got to see this. No, this is not the trailer to an alien sequel. Those creepy blue sea creatures are actually watching up here on California beaches in huge numbers. Those slimy little swimmers are complete with these rigid uh, snail-like spines. They've got these uh, tiny blue tentacles that they use to catch their Pray. Fair warning, you might want to steer clear unless you want those things, I don't know, haunting your dreams. We'll be right back. And thanks for joining us. We are 30 minutes past the hour, so let's get you caught up in 30 seconds. Both, both Tennessee lawmakers, Representative Justin Jones and Justin Pearson, have now been reinstated to their seats. Jones was reinstated Monday, and Pearson was reinstated earlier today. In Louisville, 911 calls from Monday's shooting have been released, including one 911 call from the alleged shooter's mother. And the price of eggs is back down to under $4. Inflation has hit a two-year low, according to numbers released earlier today. And Fox News is in hot water right now. A Delaware George, uh, judge has sanctioned the network for withholding evidence in a defamation lawsuit. The judge is overseeing the Dominion voting systems lawsuit against Fox News. Now, Dominion is suing Fox for nearly $2 billion, accusing the network of smearing its reputation. NBC's legal analyst Danny Savalos joins us now. Danny, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about this sanction? 
The world of sanctions is something that happens more often than you might think in civil litigation. And in fact, the world of one party hiding the ball or playing games with discovery and disclosure probably happens more than we can even imagine. The problem is, since in our system we rely on the honor system for parties to turn over discovery, we often never find out when a defendant has played hide the discovery. So when one defendant is found to have hidden discovery, that's when judges may tee off on that defendant. But uh, often sanctions can take the form of monetary penalties, but they can even go to the level of striking the answer. In other words, deeming the allegations in the complaint admitted. Now, admittedly, that is the most drastic remedy and rarely, rarely granted. But if egregious enough, a court may consider it. I don't see that happening in this case because the stakes are so high. No judge wants to take the case away from the defendant. So uh, what I expect more likely is they'll investigate. And if they played hide discovery, then there will be monetary sanctions and they won't be minimal. If they played hide discovery in that investigation, could more discovery, could more evidence come to light? Yes, and even more so in the modern era, because we communicate mostly by email, with the, the exception of Trump and maybe a few others. Uh, most of us create a digital trail of what we communicate. If I send a document nowadays to an opponent, uh, an opposing party, I email it. I don't stick it in the mail, and I have a record of what went where. And it, included in that is discussions about discovery, what to disclose, who searched for what and when. In New York, for example, there's a thing called a Jackson affidavit. A judge can order a party to submit a sworn affidavit that they conducted a search, where they searched, what was found, how they conducted the search. Now, again, if you're willing to lie on an affidavit, I guess that doesn't mean much, but it is a layer of assurances that is supposed to make us trust in the system. Uh, the discovery system is on your honor, and unfortunately, too often there are litigants who are not on their honor. Uh, what's been Fox's response? Well, Fox's response is going to be that they didn't hide discovery. And if they typically, this is the way it happens. If a party's accused of hiding discovery, they say, we didn't do it. And then they retreat to, well, if we did do it, then it was accidental. We, it was inadvertent. We missed this discovery. We put it in the wrong pile. After all, Your Honor, there are terabytes worth of discovery, uh, millions of pages of documents. So you can understand, Your Honor, how we may have missed this. That's a pretty common answer. And frankly, judges will give litigants a second chance uh, most of the time. But it all depends on how serious and how intentional the violation is. NBC's Danny Savalos, thanks so much. And quick PSA, the average price of eggs costs less than $4. Again, we repeat, the average price of eggs is now less than $4. And that's because inflation is at its lowest level in the last two years. Last March, inflation was only up about 5% from a year ago. It's the ninth month in a row that the annual inflation rate has dropped. And if you're wondering, well, what else is cheaper? Well, grocery prices dropped just a little bit compared to February, specifically for, for meat, poultry, fish, eggs, and if you're curious, a dozen eggs now cost about $3.45, but overall, food is still pretty expensive, uh, much more expensive than it was a year ago. The price at the pump is starting to come down a little bit too, 4% since February and 17% compared to last year. Here to walk us through all of this is Editor-in-Chief of Investopedia, Caleb Silver. Uh, Caleb, not all good news here. Can you talk to us about uh, housing prices? Yeah, housing prices, especially what we call shelter, when we look at the CPI report, still up about 8.2% year over year. A lot of that is the rental market. Why? Because these rise in interest rates has made that six year, uh, the 30-year fixed mortgage over 6%, which has pushed a lot of buyers into the rental market where supply is very tight. So rental price is still very high. Shelter price is still very high. You mentioned food. Yeah, eggs are cheaper. Milk is cheaper. Uh, meat is cheaper, but not cereal, not bread, so your Captain Crunch, still very expensive. And food away from home, when we go out to eat, that is up over 8% year over year. So we have that, plus transportation. If you've taken public transportation or Ubers lately, you've noticed an increase there. So you're seeing a bump in prices on the things we have to spend in every month, and that's why inflation is still sticky high at around 5%. So the next natural question, if inflation is starting to drop, are we going to see any more rate hikes from the Fed? Because uh, we've seen 
nine rate hikes now since March of last year, right? Yeah, remember, the Federal Reserve wants uh, inflation at around 2%, a little over 2%. We're still at 5%, so there's a ways to go. That's where Chair Powell always says there's still a ways to go. The only way to combat that is by rising, raising interest rates. The Fed meets again in about 25 days. They're probably going to raise rates again another quarter of a percent, but we shall see. The Fed is also concerned, we read the minutes today of their last meeting, about what's happened in the banking industry, and that could slow the economy down a lot just because banks have become very tight and are not lending as much these days. So we have inflation, rising interest rates, and the concern around banks that may slow down the economy. And Caleb, you know, at the end of last year, we were hearing recession, recession, recession almost every day. Uh, haven't heard that in some time. Should, should we still be concerned? Yeah, and we're probably going to have one because the economy is slowing. The Federal Reserve projects the GDP will come in at around 0.2, 0.4% this year. Big slowdown from last year. Next year, it starts growing again. But a recession is really personal. We talk about it a lot, and you won't change your behavior unless something happens to you. If you lose your job, if your home gets foreclosed on, if your neighbor loses their job, you feel it that way. It's very personal for a lot of people. But the technical indicators are showing us if we're having one, it would be very different from the rest because unemployment still below. 4%, and a lot of the other indicators, including consumer spending, still pretty strong. It might be like a growth recession, which we've had in the past. It may not last that long, but we're definitely due for slower growth. Caleb Silver, thanks so much. And remember the more than 30 atmospheric rivers that dumped all the rain and snow here in California? Well, there were some bright spots, and we're starting to see them emerge. This is a natural super bloom that I am dying to take my daughter to go see in a couple of weeks. But way up there in the mountains, we're looking at a whole lot of snow that is starting to melt, and that is causing some big risks for widespread flooding throughout the state. The snowpack in California is one of the biggest on record, and when that runoff kicks into high gear, we could see a lot of flooding in the San Joaquin Valley and the Tulare Lake Basin. Let's bring in Daniel Swain. He's a climate scientist at UCLA. Daniel, I feel like people watching this are thinking, well, at least the drought's over. Oh, look, super bloom, crisis averted. Uh, is that the case here? Yeah, well, there's certainly been a lot of drought uh, relief to go around uh, with all the flooding that we've seen uh, in recent weeks and months in California. And along with the flooding that we're likely to see uh, emerge further in the weeks to come as that snow starts to melt. Uh, and so, of course, all of this is occurring in the context of what was a, a historically severe drought coming into this water year. So there are a lot of benefits that are coming from uh, getting this much water uh, in terms of alleviating those drought concerns. Of course, there is uh, s such a thing as too much of a good thing all at once. Too much of a good thing all at once, and we're looking at those pictures of, of all that snowpack. That snowpack has to turn into water. That water has to go somewhere. A lot of it is recharging aquifers. Um, but when it comes to one of the things that people in California talk about so often, uh, the solution to trying to capture as much fresh water as possible before some of it runs into the ocean, where do we stand on that right now? Well, a contemporary reality is that most, if not the vast majority of California's major river systems already have big dams and reservoirs on them. So sometimes folks ask, why don't we build more dams? Well, there are, of course, environmental and ecological downsides to that. But the other practical reality is there just isn't really anywhere else to build them. There already are a lot of dams in California. And big dams are not necessarily capable. They're not really the right tools for the job when it comes to capturing these massive volumes of water uh, flowing into them at one time. So the challenge is in California, especially, the water doesn't inflow nice and gradually, but you get these huge pulses either from winter storm rainfall or snow melt later in the year, at the pulses that are so big that they would fill even the largest reservoirs in California multiple times over. And so the key, I think, is thinking in terms of other ways, alternative ways that don't necessarily involve storing water in, in these big reservoirs, but supplementing them with, with storing water underground in aquifers. And one great challenge in the recent drought in California is that the aquifers have been significantly overdrafted. So what we could be doing is thinking about expanding floodplains and expanding active groundwater recharge. Yeah, fingers crossed that that happens. Daniel, thanks so much for joining us.
And today, the White House has a new warning for a deadly street drug called Trank. It's an annual animal tranquilizer, and it's getting mixed into fentanyl. NBC News correspondent Dasha Burns went to Philadelphia to see its debilitating impacts. And a warning, some of the images you're about to see are disturbing. This is a typical day in Kensington, a neighborhood in Philadelphia. As police, homeless services, sanitation services come and clear out areas like this one, in the debris, you'll often find images like this. Narcan stashed away in a wall right next to a syringe. A life-saving treatment alongside the thing that kills. This place is the epicenter of Philadelphia's opioid crisis, the largest open-air drug market in the Northeast. On a given day, 400 to 800 people are on the streets here looking for their next high. But Kensington is also home to thousands of families. Their lives impacted by this crisis. Every day here, scenes of heartbreak. Curtis Benson is looking for his daughter. She's addicted to opioids and has been missing for three weeks. She had got about nine months clean and just took a turn for the worse. I just need to know that she's still amongst the living. I just don't know what else to do. According to the Philadelphia Police Department, fathers like Curtis are a common occurrence here. We get it once or twice a day. You'll have parents come up, grandparents, aunts, uncles, you know, showing us pictures. Philadelphia had its highest death toll ever from unintentional drug overdoses in 2021. And for the first time, black Philadelphians were hit the hardest, making up 42% of the lives lost. And it's getting worse. Further poisoning the drug supply here is xylazine. See, you're not screaming like before. That's a plus sign. Also known as Trank. Okay. It's an animal tranquilizer that sedates while getting you high and leads to both intense withdrawals and severe wounds. Uh, uh, uh. The city is piloting a mobile wound care van to combat Trank's effects. Why is a wound care van necessary in this community right now? Individuals are getting these wounds from injecting the xylazine, and this can lead to amputations. This can lead to flesh-eating wounds. It might inhibit a person to getting treatment or housing. We met Eric when he asked the police to get him treatment for his wounds. That's from the the trank that they've been mixing. When you're in pain, it makes you more likely to use because you want to relieve the pain. Even though it was the drugs that created the wounds? There is no fentanyl that doesn't have trank in it. Trank further complicating problems for residents, outreach workers, and law enforcement here. Sergeant Michael Hannison has spent most of his career here in Kensington. We just spent the day with your officers. We saw a lot of illegal activity around. No arrests, though. Why? So my team focuses on options that are outside the normal scope of thinking. We try and think outside the box. It's all good then today. Nobody wants to go up Maricky, talk to anybody. We really do try and give them an option to get clean instead of just locking them up and taking them to jail. Oh, how's it going? Okay. You on the list? It's not just compassion, it's also a lack of resources. It's different here because we, have, we are flooded with crime and 911 calls, so we have to respond to the crimes against people first. We have to respond to the rapes, the robberies, the shootings, the stabbings, and they take precedence over the users that are in the streets, unfortunately. Now, Kensington will have more resources. Pennsylvania got $2.2 billion in a settlement with the drug companies that fueled the opioid crisis. $7.5 million allocated to Kensington. Bill McKinney has lived here for 22 years and is the president of New Kensington Community Development. This isn't just a Kensington problem. This is an American problem that we would allow in this rich of a nation for this to be taking place is insane. We're sitting across the street from uh, a park. You don't hear dozens and dozens of kids running around out there. There's a few. It's too dangerous. Community activists like Bill are leading the charge on how to spend these funds. Much of that money will go towards fixing housing, schools, and parks, as well as bolstering services for those suffering from addiction, like more wound care vans and mobile methadone clinics. How is this maybe different than, than past approaches? I think it's created a type of momentum that also reminds people that all of us are involved with this and that this isn't about the residents versus folks who are struggling with substance use disorder. This is about how do we help everybody?
And coming up, detecting cancer could soon get a lot faster and happen a lot earlier, all using artificial intelligence. We're going to explain how next. And here's some of the other headlines we're watching tonight. Donald Trump is suing his former lawyer, Michael Cohen, for a half a billion dollars, according to a new court filing. Trump accuses Cohen of violating attorney-client privilege and, quote, spreading falsehoods. Cohen is a key witness in Trump's criminal indictment, to which Trump alleges he did nothing illegal. E-cigarette maker Jewel Labs has reached a $462 million settlement with six states in Washington, D.C., bringing an end to a lawsuit claiming the company marketed its products to kids. As part of the settlement, Jewel didn't admit to doing anything wrong. And NPR is leaving Twitter and is now the first new major news organization to do so. NPR made the call after Twitter labeled it a government-funded media. The head of Twitter, Elon Musk, responding late today by tweeting, defund NPR. And a large forest fire is burning in central New Jersey. It's already burned nearly 4,000 acres, and firefighters are keeping a close eye on the weather because it could get worse. And finally, remember this sound? Yep, that is the unforgettable original 1985 theme from Super Mario Brothers, which is now the first video game tune to enter the Library of Congress. The theme song is one of the 25 new inductees to its National Recording Registry, joining the likes of Madonna and Mariah Carey. And now to the future of everything. It is a no-brainer that artificial intelligence is changing the way we do things, and with some of the most exciting advancements we're starting to see happening in the world of medicine. For example, Japanese scientists say AI was faster and better at reading heart ultrasounds compared to actual doctors, and the researchers are hoping to eventually get FDA approval to use that AI model. At MIT, they're working on an AI algorithm to make organ transplants more equitable, and now AI could be key at detecting cancer that not even doctors can see. NBC's Dr. John Torres takes a look at how it works. Don Roberts is lucky to be alive. No one ever thinks they're at risk for developing lung cancer. During a treatment for a kidney stone, doctors found a mass in his lung and were able to operate before the cancer spread. They would never have found it, and in all likelihood, I would not be here talking with you today. Breathe in. The CDC recommends people at high risk for the disease get screened with a low-dose CT scan. But even with regular screening, the most skilled radiologists can't spot everything. This looks normal to you. You Correct. don't see a cancer here. How often are we missing lung cancer diagnoses right now? Well, most people who get diagnosed with lung cancer unfortunately present with stage 4 metastatic disease because it has spread someplace that is causing them a pain or a symptom and then they go to their doctor. So we're missing most cases of early stage lung cancer when people don't have symptoms. The possibilities are limitless. Dr. Leisha Sequest is part of a team of doctors and engineers from Massachusetts General Hospital and MIT trying to revolutionize cancer detection. Meet Sybil, an artificial intelligence program, the name inspired by the oracles of ancient Greece. We developed Sybil, an algorithm that is able to tell who might be at risk for lung cancer one, three, five years down the road. Lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer death in the U.S., killing more than 127,000 a year. The MassGen MIT study, using three sets of independent scans, found that Sybil could accurately predict whether a person will develop lung cancer in the next year, up to 94% of the time. There's an immense amount of data in a CAT scan, and we're only scratching the surface when we just look at it with our eyes. Usually a radiologist is looking for nodules or a mass, but Sybil has the power to look so closely at a CT scan that it can identify patterns of data associated with cancer even before a tumor appears. So this is AI in action. What do we see here? AI circled this area in red and said this area has a dangerous pattern. It looks like cancer might come up. Two years later, there's a cancer right in that same spot where the AI predicted it would be. That's not to say AI will replace radiologists, but the research team in Massachusetts believes Sybil's assistance is the future of the field. Is AI going to save lives? Yes, it will save lives because it will enable us to do more, see more, and manage better than we did without AI. 
Clinical trials for Sybil are ongoing, FDA approval likely years away. And while doctors are still studying the technology, Don Roberts, who is now cancer-free, believes technology like Sybil could help him live longer. You need every weapon you can possibly get to combat cancer. And AI could be a powerful one. Absolutely. Dr. John Torres, thanks so much for that report. And a lot of factors play into the decision to have kids, right? Obviously, there's the money, there's housing, but what about climate change? Well, it turns out it's making some people think twice. That's straight ahead. And tonight, we're digging into some of the angst some people have about starting a family or what the future is going to look like for the kids that they do have. And that's because of climate change. With so much happening, more people say they are worried about the climate changing more than ever before. NBC's Angie Lassman has more in tonight's temperature check. As the climate crisis gets worse, climate it's fueling a wave of anxiety in younger generations. Some say they're rethinking whether they want to start a family or even how they'll do it in a world with a very uncertain climate future. We're not sure that we're going to have kids because we don't want to bring our kids into a world like this. I don't have kids, but it has impacted my thoughts. I definitely want to leave the world in a better place uh, for my kids. I want to make sure to raise children who are aware of this. Now, according to a recent poll, almost a quarter of them say climate change is impacting their decision to become a parent. And people under the age of 35 are more likely to report climate change as a reason not to have children compared to those born in the decade before them. Millennials and Gen Z were born into the most rapid time of global warming and grew up with more frequent and intense climate change fueled disasters than any generation before them. Think Hurricane Katrina, the massive wildfires across the West, and an unprecedented amount of tornado outbreaks that are already double the average for this point in any single year. Some experts say the concerns about how to raise a family during this time are only growing. Children symbolize the future. People tend to not want children if they don't feel hopeful and optimistic about the future ahead of them. Lindsay Hervitz says climate change is a big factor in why she's not having children. It would just be so scary to bring a child into this world right now. I know the world is not ending in 50 years, but the natural disasters are going to continue to get worse and worse. Growing up, the 38-year-old says she always thought she'd have kids. But when she got older, Hervitz started to rethink parenting. I started thinking about, like, what am I leaving my child to? And what world am I leaving them to? So it's just going to continue to get worse until we as a society and we as a government do something about it. A new U.N. report says there's still hope to curb the catastrophic effects of climate change if governments take swift action now. In the absence of effective leadership that really cares about this issue, potential parents, people who want to have children, people who care about the climate and care about future generations, are really going to have to instill a completely different set of values in their own families. What's the plan to solve climate change? Science Moms, a group of moms from across the country, looks to empower families to make changes to off-put climate change. When you decide to have kids, you don't know what having kids is going to be, right? No one can prepare you for parenthood. Including new ways to electrify your home, talking and sharing with your children and other families about climate, and asking local officials about plans to tackle pollution. There's nothing that's going to commit you more to a better world than having a, a child. Angie Lastman, NBC News. And it's time now for some of the big stories to watch out for tomorrow. Former President Donald Trump is scheduled to return to New York tomorrow for another deposition. This time, it's for the financial fraud lawsuit against him. Also, the Florida House could vote to ban all abortions after six weeks of pregnancy. And we are going to continue to follow that massive fire at a plastics facility in Indiana. New reports say there might be asbestos in that debris. The EPA says it could take several more days to understand what's actually in all that smoke and fallout. And that does it for us tonight. I'm Gotti Schwartz. Hopefully we'll see you here tomorrow, but until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.